and welcome to Visual Radio. It is with great sadness that I have to announce the passing of a very dear friend. Um, um, her name is Claire Smith, and she w was a major, major figure in the Melrose Humane Society, which, as you know, I'm a member of, we are staunch supporters of. Claire's passing is so monumental and uh, painful because Claire rescued a lot of animals that would have been put down for years and years. And it's really sad that so many of the, the, the good soldiers, the great people, leave us too soon because Claire had a lot more work to do and she's been taken from us. I think she had a fall. I spoke with her husband a couple of weeks ago and I heard from Marie Mazio from Kitty Connection today on email. And I just hate that, uh, getting it on email, you know, I dreaded it. I saw her name and I knew the time had come and, and it, it was very painful. First person I ever read on email that was a friend of mine that passed away was the, the late great Nick Vinay. Nick produced the Beach Boys and he uh, negotiated the Jimi Hendrix, uh, Curtis Knight recordings for Capitol. Worked with Linda Ronstadt, Jim Croce and his record label put out American Pie by Don, Don McLean. So, uh, I think it was back in 1999, I got an email from his girlfriend and Nick is gone and it just shocked me. Getting it on email is just very hard. And just seeing Claire's name tonight, I want to dedicate this show to her. We're going to do a lot of work this year for Animal Rescue in Claire Smith's name. So just a moment of silence for my dear friend Claire Smith. It is the first visual radio of 2012. Today's January 5th, three days away from Elvis Bowie and David Presley's birthday. Or is it David Presley, Elvis Bowie? I haven't figured it out, but their birthday's on the 8th. Next Friday is Friday the 13th. Uh, I think on the 26th of, of January, we'll have a taped edition of Visual Radio as I intend to be at Medford City Hall for the Verizon hearings. Verizon may be coming into Medford. Might be in Medford as of the 26th, 27th, uh, February 1st. It looks like it is a done deal. I spoke at the City Council this past Tuesday. We had a robust discussion about Verizon coming to Medford. Now, hopefully, we can lobby to get WinCam on the Verizon they give five public access stations from what I understand. So they give five public access stations to um, each city or town that they are broadcasting in. So if you subscribe to Verizon here in Winchester, there's probably four other stations, maybe Burlington, maybe Woburn. I'm not sure how they designate it. We are on the entire RCN network. So even though RCN is not in Winchester, I'm one of the, perhaps the last show that's on all the RCN systems in Massachusetts. And I believe we're on Saturday night, 7 o'clock, and Sunday night, 7 o'clock. So the Peter Kahlo show will be going over to them next week, because I've had a busy, busy post-holiday season, as I'm sure you all have. Tonight we have two topics. Skip Williamson a uh, legendary, legendary American underground cartoonist will be phoning in. And then Frank Dallastrito will be talking about Lady Frankenstein. Upcoming shows will feature Steve Hunter of the Alice Co Cooper Group and Lou Reed's band. Steve Hunter is on the brand new Alice Cooper Welcome to My Nightmare, which is the uh, follow-up to the original Welcome to My Nightmare. Uh, let's see, Rob Fraboni has been promising to come on the show, so we'll talk about the Rolling Stones' new reissue of Some Girls and the Layla album, because Rob, of course, works with Eric Clapton and the Rolling Stones. I don't think he worked on either of these albums, but because he's so closely associated with Clapton and the Stones, he'll make a great guest. Dina Miller, the daughter of Jimmy Miller, will be phoning in at some point in 2012. We have tons of guests lined up. Fantastic Jerry Ross, I hope to have next week. So next week, we postponed 
talking to Jerry. I heard Keith's 98.6 today on North Shore 104.9. And so uh, that was produced by Jerry Ross. I've heard three of his songs now in the past week. Sunny by Bobby Hebb. Keith's 98.6. And uh, Apples, Peaches, Pumpkin Pie by Jay Proctor and the Techniques. Song originally recorded for Bobby Hebb. It's in the vaults. I don't think Bobby put a vocal on it. It went to Jay Proctor, became a big hit. And when I listened to it the other day, I'm saying, my God, he's got Bobby's inflections. It's Bobby's voice influenced Jay's voice. Never noticed it until like 40 years later. Okay, so let us make a phone call. Hello, Skip. Yes. Welcome to Visual Radio. You're live and on the air. Oh, well, terrific. Who well, are you? What about? In good timing? Yeah. Good. Good. Now, you know our own Don Daniel. I know. He's the one that uh, told me about you and made the connection between us. Yes. I'm happy for that. Don's a good man. He's on our board of directors here at WingCam. Oh, good. And you are on Visual Radio Live. Um, boy, I've got the Wikipedia pages on you. They're quite extensive. And I've got to say, I love your Facebook. Thank you for friending me tonight. I love the comic book art. Yeah, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get as much up as possible uh, to just, you know, get the historical record down in terms of, you know, the diversity of what I've done and what I do. So uh, that's kind of what Facebook's about. I'm trying to get it all up before they bump me off of Facebook for being inappropriate. Did they? Uh, they might. They uh oh. They could down a few things, and I think if I hit them again with something they disapprove of, they'll probably uh, get rid of me. But uh, so I'm, I'm I'm trying to get as much up as possible in the meantime. You know, that's the the very strange thing about the um, the internet. We really need to have backup of all our sites because. Um, if a YouTube or a Facebook doesn't like a video or two, you want to have it all archived. Right. And you won't have to do the work again. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that's done with something like Facebook. I, but, um, I don't want to advertise products, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll send you an email. Um, we were at a convention last May, and there is a company that backs up the uh, Yahoo accounts and other mail accounts for like five bucks a month. You get like 20 accounts backed up. Oh, that's terrific. Sounds good. Yeah, so uh, there are companies like that out there, and I really need to, um, you know, because content, you know, as you know, Skip, content, so important. I know, absolutely. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you have the TV on right now or the computer? Do you see us on wincam.org? Uh, you know, much someone, uh, my partner in crime, Jay Lynch, said that he wanted to know if we would be, if you'd be on there, but let me get to the computer right now, and... Uh, I'm holding up the uh, WinCam, W-I-N, C-A-M, uh, yeah, I've got the link here, I think. So, um, yeah, I'm holding up the Mission Impossible red poster. I'm going to get your opinion of it. All right, well, let me, let me get there. All right, uh, Hi, yeah, WinCam. And I will talk as you're getting there. Uh, there's three of these posters, and we had... Um, whole bunch of them out here for people. There are black, a yellow, and a red. And this is the red. With the tallest building in the world, Dubai, Mission Impossible right. Ghost Protocol. Right. Can you see it? I see it, yeah. I'm watching it right now. Cool. So, uh, what, uh, do you, what do you think of that? The poster itself? Yeah. Uh, it looks like a needle. <laughs> it looks like a singularity, doesn't it? It does, yeah, it does. I'm always impressed by, you know, innovation and, you know, what crazy things people are doing, what sort of illogic goes on in the artist and architect's mind. Now, they have a smaller poster that I'm holding up, and Tom Cruise is in the middle, and what was that movie he did with Colin Farrell uh, with the uh, Crimes in Advance? Oh, with the, uh, the three psychics. Anyways, that's the costume oh. he wore in that movie. 
um, I should know that movie title, but um, anyway, it's really fascinating that they took an old image of his from a previous movie, made it the central point on a poster for a new movie. I'm sure, that's not an accident. Yeah, <laughs> I know. We said I can't see uh, the movie is Ghost Protocol, yeah. Mission Impossible. Oh, okay. Impossible. That's the recent one, right? It's doing quite well. In fact, I call it the James Bond movie that they dropped the ball on. Yeah. It's a really good James Bond movie without Bond in it. And uh, Tom Cruise is very. No Daniel Craig. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Daniel, of course, is in that kind of a Sherlock Holmesy movie, The um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Right, which uh, uh, I've seen the originals of that, the uh, Swedish versions, and I like them very much, but I hear that this version is not so great. Well, I enjoyed it. Uh, it's two hours and 40 minutes, which is even longer than Ghost Protocol, which is like two hours and 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed it, but maybe the Swedish... I enjoyed, I certainly enjoyed the originals, uh, uh, the foreign language movies, they were excellent. So I am kind of interested in seeing what's going on with the American version. I think it's a fascinating thing in pop culture to have a movie come out two years. It's only been two years, right, between the two films? Yeah. Yeah, everything is accelerating. So before we talk, before we talk about you, I want to ask what you read for comic books that aren't your own before we get to you. No, I don't read comics. Ah. I, almost never, I almost never see comics. I'm, uh, part of the reason is because I'm disappointed in them. Um, I, I certainly don't like the genre of comics, you know, men in tights that appeal to 13-year-old boys. It's just, uh, and, I, and, uh, and, and as for the, the, the young cartoonists these days, most of them are quite, uh, it, there's just no energy in them. It's all about drinking coffee and being full of angst. Uh, whereas uh, when we started uh, the underground comics, it was like an explosion and uh, full of energy and a completely different genre, something that really doesn't exist too much anymore. So I don't, I don't go to comic book shops. Very interesting. Um, I grew up on Jack Kirby and even Frank Frazetta. And oh yeah, well those, are, those two are excellent guys now. I did, a, uh, I did a drawing uh, that after Jack Kirby died, uh, they put together a, a, a book of other artists interpreting Jack Kirby's characters, and uh, I did look at the pages there. So I've drawn Kirby from his sketches. Oh, um, really? Yeah. And uh, where are these available? Or are they yet? Um, uh, yeah, they've been out for a while. Uh, um, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure where they're available. I, I, I would assume that uh, there are still copies available, but I don't know for sure where you could purchase one. It would probably have to be a mail order. Um, do you have books out? Do I what? Do you have books out? Because I, I don't know. Uh, I haven't read the whole thing yet, so sorry. I have. Uh, yeah, I have two e-books out. I put out this year, and both are memoirs. One is about working at Playboy. And the other is about the birth of the underground comics. And it's, it's interesting stuff. It's full of, you know, murder and, and, and uh, uh, irresponsible drug usage and lots of sex and, you know, the things that people like. Now, is John Dante still with us, do you know, from Playboy? Who? John Dante. He worked over there with Hefner. Dante. Um. I, I was very close friends with John. Uh, rival magazine called. Oh no no John Dante worked with um with uh, Hefner. Jojo Lane knew him and she told me about. Yeah him. yeah John Dante yeah as a matter of fact I was, I was at the Playboy Mansion once and uh, John Dante had some very powerful weed I do remember him. <laughs> <laughs> I only know because we had a conversation. It was me it was me Hugh Hefner John Dante and Harry Reigns. Oh my God. Yeah. Harry Reams, who has never been a centerfold for Playboy. Nor would he have, um, <laughs> nor would it help circulation, would it? No, no, it wouldn't. Well, they've got circulation problems enough, you know. The magazine is completely gone into the toilet, but. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Got, yeah, they got, uh, uh, 
government in law now that they push it, they settle a lot of those issues, but uh, they're having a hard problem. Everything's got to be reinvented, and like you said, the whole underground comic thing was so vibrant. Fritz the cat. Exactly. Uh, we started. We started doing underground comics, and by we, I mean me and Robert Crumb and Jay Lynch in um, 1968. And uh, our comic uh, out of Chicago. We, Jay Lynch and I lived in Chicago, and we published a magazine called the Chicago Mirror. And uh, then we decided to change it to a comic format, and Robert Crumb came to town on a Buffalo protesters, protesters for the Democratic Convention, and we sat around and created the first issue of Bijou, which was, after Zap, the second uh, underground comic. So that's kind of how that, that thing exploded. It was just the energy of cartoonists working together, and then all of a sudden they were, they were everywhere. Now, do you know Buzzy Linhart? Buffy, Buffy Linhart. No. He wrote the song, You Got to Have Friends. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he told me that Al Crumb um, modeled Fritz the Cat after him. He had an uh, album called Pussycats Can Go Far. Now, Fritz the Cat was, uh, was originally serialized in Cavalier Magazine back in the 60s. <laughs> and... Um, and, you know, it was made into a movie. Uh, Robert Crumb uh, hated the film. Uh, he disowned it because they changed the entire character in the film. And in his comic books, he later had Fritz the Cat as a jaded movie star who was killed by an ostrich um, chorus girl, and she plunged a ice pick into his head. Well, that's a good way to go. <laughs> um, Bijou Funnies. Yes. It must have been difficult to get distribution for these. It actually wasn't because there were head shops across the country. I mean, we, we distributed a lot of them, and we sold millions of copies. But uh, um, it was uh, what eventually happened was Nixon uh, uh, instituted the community standards law and put us all out of business. Uh, head shops were afraid to carry them because they're afraid they get shut down. These are like mom and pop businesses. So essentially the market dried up. Now I go to the head shops of course to buy my underground albums. Uh, Blonde, uh, what was it? Uh, the Great White Wonder by Dylan. Yeah. Liver Than You'll Ever Be, The Rolling Stones, and uh, Let It Be The Beatles, the original version was out as a bootleg stamped on the cover. So you can get these great comic books that you were doing these really compelling underground recordings. Head shops were very unique. They were. They were, they were very unique, but they were, they were the conduit to, uh, to us becoming successful because uh, um, every town had a head shop and uh, they all carried the comics. And I remember to this day, the incense, when you walk in, there'd be incense, it'd be a really oh, yeah. Yeah. Di different experience. Now, you're in Vermont. Um, why did you I live in Vermont. Why did you choose Vermont? Well, I've been visiting Vermont uh, for about five years, and um, uh, I really like it here because everybody's crazy. I <laughs> again. And uh, uh, I moved in. I moved into Wilmington, Vermont, and uh, last August, we were underwater from my rain. So I'm still putting my gallery back together again. That's terrible. I hope your paintings are okay. The paintings are okay. I lost a lot of early stuff, but uh, the paintings, I got them up and out just in time. And, um, and now I'm uh, trying to uh, increase my gallery from the first floor up to the second floor and make it a bigger space. So, yeah, yeah I'm up here. Anybody, come up for skiing and come and visit the gallery. And where is the gallery located? Um, it's, on Main, it's, on, it's on Main Street. It's, uh, it's uh, at uh, 31 uh, West Main uh, uh, in Wilmington, and um, it's right in the middle of town. It shines like a beacon. I got it all lit up. You can see my images uh, from the street. That's awesome, man. Um, when you say you lost some early stuff, uh, was that originals or, or, or copies of the magazines or... Some originals, a lot of personal correspondence, 
and a lot of um, valuable uh, magazines and publications. It's just awful because um, an artist like you is also a walking library because you, no doubt, care about these creations and, and, and it's intellectual property. It's, it's a major tragedy to me. Well, it was a major tragedy for the whole town. Everybody's building back, but everybody's coming back, so I'm glad to see that. And ski season has started, so we're getting tourists into town now. And uh, I know ski season has started because the ambulances keep coming every day. It's that bad, huh? Ski season starts. Yeah, when ski season starts, you hear the ambulances going up to the mountains. So uh, it's, it's one sport that I'm reticent to uh, try. Well, for, for good reason. People get hurt. Yeah, Sonny Bono but, for one. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think a Kennedy too. Uh, one of the Kennedys. Yes, that's correct, that's correct. A lot of people, a lot of people get hurt. Uh, but uh, where I live, we somewhat depend on the, on the uh, ski crowds to come down into town and, and poke around and buy Vermont goods made in China and, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. But and I get people in and out of the gallery, but uh, I, I don't do a lot of business out of the gallery. It's mainly a showcase. Now, do people from the old days come up and visit? Well, I see, yeah, I see, I see some people. It's not a question of them coming up and visit. We keep in touch. Um, uh, I keep in touch with Jay Lynch, and uh, I don't talk to Robert Crumb uh, just because he's off in France, and there's no reason to discuss anything with him right now. And, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, we, we stay in communication with a lot of the older guys. Frank Stack who did The Adventures of Jesus, which is considered really the first underground comic book. He's the professor emeritus at the University of Missouri, chairman of the art department there. And uh, so I keep in touch with these guys. Fascinating. I speak of every now and then. Robert Crumb did, of course, the famous Janis Joplin Big Brother album. Cheap thrill. Yeah, right after he finished that is when, was when he came to Chicago to do comics with us. Oh. He just finished that, and then uh, he he came out, and we created Bijou. Sex, Dope, and Cheap Thrills. And it, it's, right. it, it's such an important album cover that gets reduced to a little CD cover. Right, I know. That's the problem with CDs, isn't it? No great album. The, the album art was such a great format for displaying artwork. Yes. And, and now you can't see anything. It's uh, absurd. Um, it is absurd. Y you know, um, what do we do? Have these album covers blow up on the internet? I don't know. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Um, actually, that album cover was intended to be the back cover for Chief Girls, and they rejected his front cover. Oh. Uh so, that's interesting backstory. So, he must have that in some of his publications. I did not know that. Uh, no, I think it's owned by the record company. It's uh, it, it may have been sold for big bucks recently. I think I heard it was. Wow. I'll have to talk yeah, to yeah. our friends at Sony about that. What? I'll have to talk to our friends at Sony about that. I'm a huge Joplin fan. Yeah, right. Me too. We recently had John Till on. John was in her Cosmic Blues band at Woodstock. Uh -huh. And the final band, Full Tilt Boogie. He's on Festival Express, and he's a friend, and he, he phoned in last August, so uh, we talked a lot about Janice and, and the tours. Um, but our crumb, yes, that was the big, uh, the big album cover, and then that I did not know that, and then he met with you people and did the, the Bijou. Right, exactly. And what, yeah. what was the concept between, behind Bijou Funnies? How did you just... Uh, I had just... Yeah, I had just just created that comics, right? And that, that and, and 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 that kind of uh, that was the comic book that, uh, that Jay Lynch and I uh, were made us inspired to change. We were publishing a magazine at the time called the Chicago Mirror, and we were inspired enough by the Zap comics that we decided to change the the uh, Chicago Mirror to be too funny. And then after that, the race was on. The, the beast was loose in the, in the fields. 
Now, uh, last week or two weeks ago, I had Carolyn Preston on. She has a new book out. It's her fourth book, uh, The Scrapbook of Frankie Pratt. And it's a fictional character, Frankie Pratt, in the 20s. But this book is literally a scrapbook. And for people like us, it is really, uh, Skip, it's really amazing. I'm flipping through it, and she's got like vinyl albums and Coney Island tickets. And she'll go to antique stores and eBay and pick up these collectibles and put them almost in an underground comic book form. Right. And it's really well done. I just said to her, this is just one of the most amazing books of the year. Because she had written regular fiction, and her husband's also a writer, and he said, what are you doing? And she was totally into scrapbooks and made this novel kind of scrapbook book. It's just, it was just issued. Uh, and yeah, I just like innovation, and what you guys did was innovative. I was gonna say, innovation is really what creativity is all about. So to take a form, if she writes fiction, to take that form and then elaborated on it in such an incredible visual way, you know, good for her. Yeah, if you get a chance to go to a bookstore or a library and see the um, Frankie Pratt uh, by Carolyn yeah. Preston, it, yeah, it, it, because of it, her taking that step, you know, it was a gamble. The, the publishers were kind of, you know, taken aback, as you would imagine they would be. Well, they don't understand innovation, you know. They know what it is, and they know what has sold for in the past, but when someone comes with something new, they're a little reticent. That's why I'm, I'm self-publishing uh, these, these uh, e-books. They're more like underground comics because I control everything and uh, I don't have to deal with pesky editors and, and wait a year for the thing to be published. You know, you just put it up. And you've got a worldwide audience. I get a better, and I get a, and I, yeah, and I get a better, and I get a better cut. I mean, with a publisher, you're lucky to get ten percent. With uh, Amazon, I get seventy percent. Uh, so it's you know an obvious, obvious way to go for someone like me. And I guess I will at some point. I mean, I've written an, an entire autobiography. It's you know well over two hundred fifty pages, and and these ebooks that I'm publishing are excerpts from that and at some point I'll get it published in a book if I can find a publisher that will do it and do it the way I want it but at this point I'm, I'm satisfied in doing uh, this uh, Kindle stuff. There's a lot of great university presses that really are putting uh, the love and, uh, and care that should go into a book. Um, oh, University of Kentucky. There's a great, uh, the count Arthur Lennig, he did the uh, biography of Bela Lugosi. Ah. So the original pressing put out uh, on a major publisher, I think it was Simon & Schuster, they sold out of the first pressing and they didn't think they could sell another pressing so they were content to sell out of the first run. Became highly collectible on eBay and Amazon. And then Kentucky Press, I believe, uh, the University of Illinois, one of these two great you know, university presses did this marvelous four or five hundred page edition, which had everything Arthur wanted in, you know, the original and more. Right, good. And we had Arthur on around Halloween. We had a great series around Halloween of, uh, you know, Dracula and whatever. Yeah, of course. But it's the university presses skip that are, uh, I'm impressed with. Yeah. I'll, I'll investigate. The, uh, my book is, uh, is like I said, it's about 350 pages, and it's another 300 pages of artwork. So it's a 600 page book, at least. So someone's got to put a considerable, uh, you know, uh, effort into it, and finances behind it, and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the publishers are just skittish. I think that's where the, the, these university presses fill a need. Because these books right. are gorgeous, and they're collectible, and I put them on a shelf, and they're never going to leave my shelf, you know? Unless I want to read them. Yeah. But they're, they're just really collectible. Now, with all the skiing up there, do you get people from all walks of life walking into the gallery? Um, I, I get minimal traffic into the gallery. I don't know exactly what that's about, but uh, people are out there to buy t-shirts, you know? And, and such. But uh, I do get people from all over. I get a lot of people from Boston. I get a lot of people from New York City. You know, the eastern seaboard comes up and skis. So, uh, yeah, we, we do get uh, people coming in from, uh, from in different locales uh, all over the place. I know that here in Milton they have the uh, artificial snow, and that's why they're skiing this week. 
Right, and that's what they've been here. Uh, and because we haven't enough snow this year. Last year we had huge amounts of snow, but this winter not so much. But it's cold enough for them to make the artificial end. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's down down into the teens and below zero at night, so it's plenty cold. I can't imagine going up to Vermont to go skiing and only to find that you're in an ambulance, you know, yeah. far from home. It's true. It's true. I've got the, there's a tavern I went I used to go to here in uh, Wellington, and there's this guy uh, named uh, Rescue Joe, and he works as a rescuer up on the mountains. Gets people who've been injured, and then he come he came in one afternoon. He had a, a hard morning. He said, "Yeah, we had uh, ruptured spleen, uh, uh, some ruptured kidneys, two broken legs. You know, just amazing amount of injury going on up there." And you never hear about this. People just say, let's go skiing. You know, there was a, um, a kid fell off of a ski lift here in Boston yesterday. Did you hear about that? Uh, no, I, I missed that. Nine, 19 years old, uh, died. Uh, uh, they're thinking he might have had a... Um, what? what? What is he doing? <laughs> well, no, he was. they think that he might have had a seizure on the lift. He was on the lift, and he fell out of the lift. Yeah. And they found him face down in the snow, and he was with a skiing team from the high school. Ah. Uh, of course, being 18 or 19, I don't, um, yeah. he seems older than high school, but um, you can find it online. It's a very, very sad story. Yeah. But as with anything, there are risks. Um, but I, I would just, I would rather be at a gallery than, uh, you know, uh, having to repair my kidneys. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> The question. <laughs> and um, do you have public access TV up there? Uh, we do, but I don't have TV. Ah. I, I, live, I live without TV. The only thing I use TV for, for is Netflix. Oh, so you have a TV for Netflix? I've got TV, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to any service. Uh, I just uh, I order Netflix and watch my movies on the TV. So they mail them to you, or they, or they're online, or how does that work? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm getting them mailed to me. I don't have the technological capacity to stream them. Uh, right. yeah, I need a more updated computer, but uh, that will come. But as you're seeing our TV show right now on your computer, um, you can watch your Wilmington, Vermont public access. Really? Yes, and uh, if they're streaming, and I would imagine they are, and if you like this interview, I'll probably send you a DVD if you want. Oh, I love it. And if you like the interview, you can just go down to your access station and say, here, please, please play this for me. Oh, okay. You know, the only rules are we can't do calls for action, so we can't, you know, we can't be an infomercial, so we don't do that. And I like to keep it clean because I want to be played 24-7. Of course. Instead of just in the safe harbor, at harbor after 11, you know. Right, right. We were transferring my Margaret show, the comedian, video yesterday. It's 11 years old, and, I, and uh, she used a lot of cuss words in her lecture. So I, I like to bleep them out, not for censorship, just so that I can get more right, I know. of an audience. Access, yeah, right. It has to do with access. The, uh, yeah, right. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll try not to use any cuss words in this interview. You haven't yet, and that saved me from editing. Okay, well, I want to save you some work there, Joe. Well, you, you know, it's important because... Uh, I know it is, I know it is. No, you know, and you're a very important figure, and we're honored to have you on here tonight. Uh, do you get back down to Boston at all? Well, you know, if I'd had a little more uh, advanced notice about this, I'd be in the studio with you right now. It's not that far away. You're about two and a half hours away, I think. Well, I wouldn't want you to come down just for our show because we're here every week, and if you're down in the area, you're well, more than welcome to just say, hey, Joe, you know... Give me this Thursday, you know? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. you hear from me again. And if I'm busy yeah. that night, you're the host. Yes. Yeah. Right. You hear the way if I'm busy that night, you're the host. Yeah. So you can have... Well, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we just have fun, man. We have fun. Oh, uh, it sounds like it. But, you know, I was, you know, I was, the end of my comics were just the beginning, and I'm, I'm pretty much linked into that because I'm a historical figure in it. But um, I also uh, worked on staff at Playboy Magazine for 10 years, and uh, there's some like quite crazy stories about that. Now, what did you do uh, for Playboy? 
I was art director. Uh, I was special projects art director. I could cre create my own projects, and they'd send me off to do them. Um, I designed pages, uh, uh, hired models, uh, art directed photography sessions. Um, but, but mainly, I, uh, I dealt with some of the greatest writers and illustrators on the planet and uh, laid out uh, laid out uh, pages for the magazine. So if there was an iconic issue, say the John Lennon-Yoko Ono interview from 1980, yeah. did you work with that one? No, I did not. I didn't do the interview stuff. I did the fiction. I did, you know, like John Updike. And, oh. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of uh, serious writers. And, uh, and I also created humor projects for them, something you never see in the magazine now. Uh, I did a lot of kind of almost National Lampoon type uh, Fewer packages for them over the years. Now, with magazines in flux, and they're, they're way too expensive. I mean, how many magazines? I get a lot free. And if I didn't, I probably wouldn't go out and buy them. I know. Uh, and, and the thing is, uh, I, think they're, I think they're a thing of the past. You know, I mean, essentially what my Facebook page is, is a magazine. Right. You know, uh, and, and uh, it's not so much a social networking thing for me. It's, it's really, you know, uh, me posting articles I like, not always about me, or not always, you know, deal with me, and photographs I find, as well as my own art, and, and historical uh, references uh, throughout. So, um, I, I don't think magazines have, have, have much, you know, left in them. People aren't producing magazines like they used to, and certainly not quality magazines. They're slick, they're expensive. You walk into a um, Barnes and Noble, and you know it's, it's you're looking at seven, eight bucks, and it's like what? Yep. I, I like to collect them, but it's just uh, a tiny type, and you get more on the online. Yeah, it's true. I think it's all heading online. But I, I think to give up, uh, take Playboy. Uh, you can certainly work with it because it's an institution, and very carefully. Uh, reinvent it, I think. Well, you can, but you got that main roadblock there, and his name is Hugh Hefner. So he is uh, in the way. I didn't realize that. Well, he, uh, I don't know if I would describe him as so much in the way. It's just he's very um, uh, insistent on, on, on what he likes, and he lives a very cloistered life. And uh, it doesn't make for a lot of innovation and new ideas. He was certainly innovative in his day. Oh, yes. So we all have a heyday. And it, in the early 60s, it was an amazing thing that he did, put together that magazine. Um, of course, he had a good crew, too. He hired a great crew. And, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and he got good writers and great writers. And they had like nowadays they interview Justin Bieber, oh. and they used to interview like Fidel Castro. You know, a big difference. It's changed. Yeah, it's become more like a people magazine kind of thing. You know, there there were great innovative covers over the years, and then uh, all of a sudden they started putting celebrities on the covers, and it looked like Cosmopolitan. So uh, I think there were basic mistakes made along the way, and they probably could have kept their their uh, subs subscriptions, uh, their, their distribution from falling away if they had continued the innovative ways that they started with. But, you know, people do what people do. Now, Larry Flint has built a really nice publishing empire with a variety of magazines. I was the first art director for Hustler. Were you? Really? That's amazing. I was, up, I was on the first issue. I, I quit halfway through the first issue because I couldn't stand Larry Flint. But, uh, but technically, I was the original founding art director of Hustler Magazine. Was this prior to Playboy? It was a pretty, it was, an, it was like a fairly conservative magazine at the beginning, and I kept telling them, I said, Larry, make it dirtier. And <laughs> he made it dirtier and took it back to Ohio, and um, uh, the rest is history. Because that book on the Flint versus Falwell trial, the book itself is marvelous. Yeah. A great First Amendment book. Yeah, right. But my point was that he has built a... I think, that Larry, despite the fact that I think he's a, 
the sleazy operator, um, he is also one of my champions in terms of First Amendment rights. Yeah, mine as well. Yeah. Um, I liked the movie. I think. It, the, it, yeah. Did you like the movie? Uh, no, I wasn't in it. <laughs> for my existence. <laughs> but yeah, I enjoyed it. Woody Harrelson, right? Yes. Yeah, right. Now, were you at Hustler before Playboy? Yes. I actually worked at Gallery. I started in the, the uh, Gallery magazines in, um, in the around 1973. I was the art director for Gallery magazine. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And then after that, Gallery folded. It was stolen by the distributors and taken to New York and changed. And, and my publisher at Gallery had formed an alliance with Larry Flint, and they decided they published a new magazine called Hustler. So they enlisted me to, to you know, to art direct it, and uh, that's how that happened. Man, that's amazing. I I'd love to explore um, that in more depth when you're here in person. Sure, we can talk about that. I mean, it's all it's uh, it, it, it's all of my 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 book Flesh, uh, the ebook Flesh, the whole story of my uh, you know working for uh, the working for magazines, uh, Mafia Connections, uh, Larry Flint, you have to. It's all in there. Now, is Flesh the first or the second book? Flesh was the first book. The second bo book is called Spontaneous Combustion. And that's about the advent of underground comics. It's about uh, me and Crum and Jay and all of the people. About my move to Chicago. And if you put these out as a full book, would you call it uh, something else? Yeah, I, I have uh, I have a couple of titles. One is uh, My Bitter Agenda, and uh, and the other is uh, Terra Incognito. Ah. So I'm not, you know, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do yet, but I've got a couple of titles for it. Those are cool. Yeah. Those are cool, man. We have only a couple of minutes left, and then we talk to our movie uh, host from Texas, Frank Delastrito. We're talking about Lady Frankenstein tonight. Huh? And we, we play public domain movies here on Friday nights. And it's fascinating. Frank says, boy, you people are playing some of the best movies. Lady Frankenstein won't fall into that category. It's a 71 Italian horror film. Friday night, huh? I'll have to tune in. Yeah, uh, we, it's great because uh, you can see a lot of these on YouTube. People upload them to YouTube. Uh, these public domain films, you can actually download them for your DVD on archive.org. They're free, you know? Yeah. And Joseph Cotton's in this one, along with Mickey Hargate, who is the father of uh, Mariska Hargate. You know, Jane Mansfield's daughter. Who and he was married to Jane Mansfield. Right. And uh, they had a kid, Mariska Hargate, uh, who's on Law & Order SVU. Right. I think she's the highest paid TV actress now that... Uh, I think I read, yeah, I think I read that somewhere, too. Because what's-his-name's off of uh, Two and a Half Men? Right, Charlie. Yeah. So Charlie was above her, and now she must have the mantle. Yep. Uh, Skip Williamson. Author, do you have a website of your own, or is it the Facebook? I've got the Facebook page. I think I may go ahead and build the website, uh, but I need to archive this stuff, so you can be some help on that. And uh, and I uh, and uh, um, I just think that I should, uh, uh, you know, just I, I got to build the website. I had one for years, and then I let it lapse. But I still own the domain name skipwilliamson.com, so it's just a matter of doing some work. You know what to do? But now it's just what? put a blog together, and then direct the scoopwilliamson.com to the blog, and then coming soon the new Skip Williamson site. I'll do that. And join Facebook, and here's my Facebook page because people have to log into their Facebook, and then search you on Google. Skip Williamson Facebook uh, cartoonist. Right. Exactly. Skip, it's been an honor, a real honor for me to talk to you today. Well, it's nice to talk to you too, Joel. And uh, we'd love to have you back on Visual Radio. I'll come down and uh, sit next to you. Oh, that'd be awesome, man. Really would. We'll do it. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. All right. Take care. Yep, bye-bye. Bye. Our first guest of the new year, Skip Williamson. You can go to wikipedia.org and put in Skip Williamson, Skip underscore Williamson, and there's a great uh, few pages on him. And 
I think next week we will have uh, Jerry Ross. I'll talk to Jerry about Bobby Hebb and Keith and Spanky and our gang. Spanky and our gang from Chicago. And Skip Williamson was there in Chicago making comic books. I should have asked him if he and Spanky McFarlane ever crossed paths. I know Buzzy Linhart stayed out at Spanky's house for a couple of weeks. Uh, they were both on the Mercury label, which was in Chicago, which is why people were in Chicago in the 60s who were in the music business. Uh, so it is time to talk Lady Frankenstein. And I pick up the phone so our stalkers don't get the phone numbers. They are out there. And we know who they are. And they know who they are.